it's six o'clock and I'd like to call to order our legislative breakfast meeting. Nine o'clock. Or nine o'clock, excuse me. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome everyone. Um, just want to go through a few things that are different this time. Uh, not only are we doing this virtually, we tried that once in June and that went pretty well, but our city attorney has given the city some rules that when we have these uh, virtual, these meetings, uh, we have to also broadcast them on WSCS. So uh, our meeting is going to be broadcast uh, to the public uh, and then we'll still have people that are online. Uh, let's just go through the attendees. Um, we have uh, a Barb, I think that's Barb Feldy, one of our older person, Charles Adams, our city attorney, Kurt Watinsky from the League of Municipalities, Jennifer Garner from Senator Baldwin's office, uh, Senator Lemahieu, uh, Eric Montanello, our uh, fire department chief, and then Daniela Trainer. Carpetillo, that's our finance director, and then Representative Terry Kotsma, and I see Alan Ott just came on, and I'm waiting for one more uh, name there to fill in. Um, we have our city clerk online, uh, Meredith De Bruyne, Eric Bushman, director of IT, and uh, WSCS organizer Scott Miloff, uh, who's making our web broadcast possible. Um, and Chris Domagowski just joined us, David Bebo. So that's who we have online right now as we start the meeting. So I want to welcome our legislators. There's been a lot of things happening in Madison. It's been great to see our legislators uh, increasing their influence and the roles that they have in the state legislature. And with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Devin Lemahieu. Uh, for an update of uh, the happenings in Madison. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, glad that these meetings are kicking off again. Um, so the last uh, five, six weeks have been fairly busy for me, as you might imagine, being um, the majority leader elect now, being elected as the next majority leader. Um, so I spent the last uh, four or five weeks um, hiring new staff. I have most of my staff complete now, which I'm excited about. Uh, meeting with my colleagues, um, getting many meetings or committee, committees uh, set up for the next legislative session, uh, introducing the committees that um, the Senate is going to have. So that was done a week, week and a half ago. Um, so we're getting excited, getting into the next session, just trying to figure out how to um, operate in this in this COVID world. Um, right now, the Capitol is still, uh, the governor still has the Capitol um, locked down. Um, so, you know, just the challenge of having, you know, public hearings, committee hearings, is, is trying to find out what the new normal is, figure that out. Um, we have plans now for Inauguration Day. Um, which is January 4th, when uh, new members and returning members uh, take their oath of office <clears throat> and get sworn in again. Um, so we have, we have plans to do that in a safe uh, manner, following CDC guidelines and things like that, and still giving families a chance to, uh, you know, newly elected senators a chance to celebrate that day with their families and uh, and get started fresh for a new new session. So. Um, we've been dealing, I've been working with the speaker and the, uh, and the governor on, um, if you've been following the news, the CARES Act funding for COVID um, all needed to be spent or needs to be spent by December 30th. So we've been working with, with the assembly and the governor's office on, you know, what we can do to help out if the federal government doesn't step up and pass another other package going forward um, and and other type of legislative changes that may need to be done to continue to have the state address um, the COVID pandemic 
uh, nimbly and effectively um, as we're still you know, obviously struggling with <coughs> cases, which fortunately are going down a little bit now, but, uh, but there are still, still new cases around and hospitals are still struggling. And as you guys probably know, local governments are still struggling. So we're working with the governor and the assembly to try to find solutions where we can all agree on. And uh, you know, outside of that, Happy to be here this morning and look forward to getting feedback from you guys. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, then next we'll move on to uh, Representative Katzma. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my focus has been on the election the last couple of months, and I was uh, very fortunate to receive 59% in the most recent election. Um, I don't know if Representative Vorpagel is on this call or not, but he was elected caucus chair, so he is now part of the assembly leadership. Uh, Speaker Voss will be appointing or releasing the names of the Joint Finance Committee members this week. Uh, I am anticipating receiving an appointment to the Joint Finance Committee, and I look forward to that serving in that responsibility uh, as well. We are very proud of, of Senator Lemieux and um, uh, his responsibilities as majority leader. So uh, happy to report that Sheboygan City at Sheboygan County is well represented in Madison. This election cycle, there was a lot of money that was being spent, uh, but the um, Assembly Republicans uh, lost two members and the margin now will be 61 to 38. And in the state Senate, they gained, picked up two members. So that margin right now is 21 to 12. Uh, so uh, Devin already spoke about inauguration. We look forward to that the first Monday in January. <coughs> that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Representative Kasma. Uh, next, we'll move on to the federal level. Uh, Jennifer Garner from Senator Baldwin's office. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for uh, letting me join you today. And before I get started with my report, let me congratulate Senator Lemigu on his election as the Senate Majority Leader. It's a, a big honor, and I think everybody in Northeast Wisconsin will benefit from having his leadership uh, in that role. Uh, Senator Baldwin has been in D.C., very busy, uh, as you may have read in the newspaper, trying to bring a, uh, a COVID relief package to fruition before the end of this year. Um, there's been another, uh, a number of other things that they've had to work on. Was a continuing res uh, one was a continuing resolution to uh, continue funding the government. Um, and there's some big pieces of legislation that are moving through right now. One of them is the National Defense Authorization Act, and there were several things in there that were important to, uh, uh, to Wisconsin. Uh, specifically for Northeast Wisconsin, there is $11.6 million for a new National Guard Readiness Center in Appleton. And uh, there's funding for a new guided missile frigate that will be built by St. Pierre Marinette Marine. And uh, there's also funding for two Virginia-class submarines, which won't be built in Wisconsin, but we have over 40 companies in Wisconsin who provide parts for those submarines. Uh, the other thing that's pending this week that will be of interest to all of you uh, once it's passed is WERDA, the Water Reforce Defenses uh, Act. I can't remember. I, I use the acronym so often I can't remember what the D stands for. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. Finally, um, she's very hopeful that this bipartisan package of COVID relief, the $908 billion package, uh, will gain some traction and, and get passed this week. One of the issues that's of paramount, paramount importance to her is um, – that the package include funding for state and local governments. I think we've all seen throughout this COVID uh, crisis just how critical um, that uh, state and local government infrastructure is. And uh, we know that in the, the upcoming years that we're going to need to, uh, to help continue to support the, those critical functions like uh, law enforcement and fire and public health. 
So she is uh, supportive of that uh, $900 million bipartisan package. A couple of other pieces of legislation, um, Restaurants Act, uh, which would create a restaurant revitalization fund um, as a community that relies uh, a great deal on hospitality. Uh, we know that uh, that uh, particular sector is suffering and we want to make sure that we do whatever we can to kind of bring them back so we don't lose that critical um, hospitality infrastructure we have in our communities. Um, a couple of other things, the Paycheck Protection Act, um, she's introduced legislation to extend that through March 2021 and allow for a second round loans for small businesses. And in this round, um, they would also uh, extend PPP to all nonprofit organizations. And that's something that uh, we heard a lot about from uh, communities. And I think we all know uh, just how much nonprofits contribute to our communities. And we want to make sure that we support them uh, uh, to the extent that we can. Um, there's another bill that's of interest, and that's the Partners Act, which would establish a grant program to support um, creation of an expansion of industry and sector partnerships to help small and medium-sized businesses develop on-the-job learning programs and provide mentoring and support services for workers. This is something that we've heard quite a bit about from, uh, I know, in Northeast Wisconsin, and that's uh, the difficulty that smaller uh, and medium-sized businesses have in accessing uh, uh, training and other resources in order to keep uh, their workforce current, uh, to recruit, recruit and retrain. And uh, you know, we know that the larger companies primarily do their own training. So we need to make sure that we have those resources for our small businesses as well. So that is just a brief snapshot. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or if there's any other piece of legislation that you are interested in you can let me know and I'll be happy to follow up uh, with you, uh, Mr. Mayor, via email and you can share that information with uh, the other members on this call. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, appreciate your report. Next, we'll move on to Alan Ott from Congressman uh, Glenn uh, Grothman's office. Alan? Good morning. Um, First thing I'll mention is uh, this month, uh, at the end of November, Congressman Grothman introduced the Air America Act. Um, this is a, uh, an idea that came directly from the district. Um, I was out in an event and heard um, Neil Hansen from Oshkosh, uh, who wrote a book uh, about his experiences flying for Air America in the Vietnam War. Um, and he requested to meet with Glenn to discuss uh, some issues, and he met with Congressman Grothman, and after the, uh, that meeting, uh, Congressman Grothman started working on a, on a bipartisan bill called the Air America Act, um, which will uh, ensure that the, the brave Americans who served in that Cold War operation will receive federal retirement benefits that they've earned. Uh, from 1950 to 1976, uh, there were about 500 American citizens worked for Air America, and because the uh, missions were covert, um, they were not able to submit pro paperwork to prove that they'd that they were ever employees of the federal government. Um, so, you know, and despite having risked their lives and, and you know, fighting, uh, fighting for America and fighting communism the same way um, the members of the Air Force did. Um, so because of this, uh, Carolyn Mul Mulroney, uh, the Democrat chairman of the um, uh, Oversight Committee, has, is a co-sponsor of this bill. We have uh, co-sponsors of both parties in the U.S. Senate. And there's a good chance that this is going to uh, to make its way through to be to, to become law. So it's kind of a neat example of, of a local constituent who brought a concern uh, to his congressman, and um, looks like it's headed towards becoming law. Um, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, uh, the they're coming back into session this week um, to take up um, kind of the twin issues of another uh, relief package for coronavirus um, and funding the government through September. Um, you know there are a lot of a lot of issues floating around there, and a lot of high-level negotiations. And we we're not uh, being given a lot of detail on what's being worked out. I know the congressman is concerned about some of the uh, you know sending out checks um, idea again. Um, it's important to note that between the Congress and the Federal Reserve, we've spent seven trillion dollars this year alone on the coronavirus, uh, you know the PPP and all the programs associated with that. 
Um, I think in real dollars, that's close to what we spent in World War II, um, and we've done that in, in you know, in, in uh, nine or ten months. So um, there are some concerns there, but there are some things that need to be addressed, including, um, you know, the the uh, time off provisions that, that were part of CARES, the sort of the CARES FMLA um, expires on December 31st. Um, there's some funding or some of the uh, idle loans uh, come up on the 21st of, of this month. So, and of course, there's been the discussion of liability protection for uh, businesses, schools, governments um, that also could be addressed. So we'll have to wait to see uh, how that turns out. So those are kind of the, uh, the big issues that, uh, that the Congressman is working on right now. Thank you very much for that report, Alan. Appreciate it. Next, we'll move on to appointments and biannual budget. And uh, I think we've covered the appointments pretty well. I, I really want to commend our legislative uh, representatives for climbing through the ranks to these leadership positions. Uh, it takes a lot of work to be recognized in, in, in this way by your fellow uh, legislators. And uh, we look forward to uh, working with you again in these new positions. But I would like to turn it over to Senator Lemahue to talk a little bit about the biennial budget and any, um, anything he can tell us about what he sees in the future there. So I'll, I'll start out, but I can let Terry um, give his two cents too, since he's serving on the finance, I'm assuming he's serving on the finance committee this, this coming session, even though that's not out there yet. Um, but, uh, so where, uh, we, so we ended the first year of our budget with a surplus, um, of the 20, the 19, 2019 to 2021 budget. Um, last summer we ended with a surplus despite the pandemic. Uh, so we made another, um, deposit into the rainy day fund, which is great. That rainy day fund is now at about $760 million. Um, and we're looking to actually finish off this year potentially with a with a surplus again. Um, I think part of that is because we were using prudent um, budgeting over this time. Um, we've had uh, our sales tax revenue has has still been really strong, um, especially through internet um, internet sales that that have gone on in the state of Wisconsin, capturing that that internet sales tax. And uh, corporate sales tax has actually been still um, pretty strong going forward. The, the place where we're sort of hemorrhaging is is you know, gas tax revenue and uh, and income tax revenue. With that being said, it's going to be <clears throat> still a a challenge going forward in this next budgeting process. Um, so we're going to going to uh, I think I I appointed a pretty strong finance committee. Um, with a lot of experience, two CPAs on there, um, someone else who's gone through the finance process, uh, left, you know, Senator Strobel on there who has, a, you know, a year going through a budget. So I think in the Senate, we have a strong finance committee, um, which is going to take out, uh, take a tough look at all areas of the budget to make sure we're, we can meet the challenges uh, that lie ahead. But it's, it's, you know, at this point, the governor will give his, his present his budget in February. Um, we're not sure exactly. Um, by statute, it has to be done. He has to do it by the end of January, but that hasn't been done in about 60 years, I believe. Um, we always give the governor an extension to, to present his budget, so that'll probably be done mid-February. Uh, then the Legislative Fiscal Bureau takes that budget, uh, breaks it down. It takes them about three, four weeks to do that. And then the Finance Committee, um, Terry and and uh, others on the Senate and Assembly side will start going through um, section by section, and uh, you know we'll have listening sessions. We don't know what that's going to look like yet. Uh, typically, we'll go around the state um, at four or five locations and have listening sessions, but that may have to be done <clears throat> some form of virtual fashion this year, depending on where the pandemic's at. When we get to March and April, probably April in that time. Um, but then hopefully uh, by the end of the year or by the end of the fiscal year, um, we'll have a present a budget to the, the governor and hopefully like two years ago, the governor signs our budget. So that's, that's the plan. Sounds good. Thanks very much for that information. Uh, Representative Kasma, did you want to add anything? 
Uh, yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we've had, uh, as Devin stated, there's four new members in the Senate on the Joint Finance on the assembly on the Republican side. Four out of six are new. In on the assembly side, uh, co-chair Nigren has resigned to take a different position. Uh, so the co-chair that has been appointed by Speaker Voss is Representative Mark Bourne from Beaver Dam. And uh, so and we're going to have two new members uh, in the Assembly Republican side of the Joint Finance. So uh, there's a big, big changes really in the in the composition and in the makeup of Joint Finance. So it'll, it'll take some time then to uh, have the personalities work out and some of that. The governor came out with agency budget requests. It's booklet about this thick. Uh, a couple of highlights from there. The largest increase that was requested was fr from the Department of Education, about $1.4 billion, uh, double digit increases. And that was disappointing after the summer when the governor uh, urged his agencies to uh, be flat with their with their increases. Uh, and the other uh, major item that was in this budget request was uh, DHS. And in there, um, they, the agency is proposing Medicaid expansion uh, to uh, account for uh, a large growth of revenues. Uh, certainly, there's resistance in the Republican caucus to uh, expand Medicaid. Um, but uh, we look forward to uh, the work on the budget. Uh, as, as Devin stated, revenues uh, appear to be a little bit better than what we thought. If, uh, and as you all know, in Sheboygan County, the unemployment rate, uh, according to W uh, or SCEDC, was 3.7% in, in September. I haven't seen more recent numbers. But if you're, if you're outside of the tourism or the hospitality industry, um, you're doing pretty good, actually, in despite um, in this in this economy that we have. So, uh, so we look forward to uh, that work on the budget. Thank you very much for those thoughts, Terry. Next, I'd like to go on and talk about levy limits, levy limits, and uh, and possible uh, re, uh, loosening of some of those. Uh, been on the agenda in the past. It's a priority not only for the city of Sheboygan, but also the League of Municipalities. And I'd like to turn it over to Administrator Todd Wolf to talk a little bit about our local situation and some of the things we're looking for. Todd? Good morning, everybody. Um, as, a, as a new member to, this, to the city and to this group, I just wanted to um, you know, just say, reach out and say good morning. And for those of you that know me, um, I'm gonna, I'd like to change our, our topic a little bit. Right now, everybody talks a lot about, about COVID, and, and rightly so. You know, it's, a, it's affected us not just uh, at, in, a, in the city level, county level, state level, or, you know, or throughout our, the United States or globally. But I'd like to point out the fact that the levy limits has been discussed and has been on, on a topic for, for many, many years. And you know, since 2011, you know, that's when the state imposed this. It, it is the strictest. Um, the um, <clears throat> limit in the in the nation. So what I'd like to kind of touch on real quickly is, you know, we talk about COVID, we talk about how it affects us, but we from a levy limit and a levy to equalize balance. This year was my first my first um, approach to developing an actual budget, and I I realized very quickly that these limits really need to be adjusted. So when I read, when I read about the, the league talking about since 2011, I sit there and go, this is kind of an old, old standard and we really need, to, as a state, need to make some course corrections. Any decision is a good decision at the time that it's made. But if we're gonna continue to have restrictions that are nine plus years old and not make adjustments, I, I don't think that that's good stewardship. So when I look at things and I look at the responsible responsibility that we have for good stewardship and maintaining and providing the services to our communities, I think it's very important that we think about that tre tremendously, especially during tough times like COVID. So the CARES Act, that, that, that helped out a lot. It helped us out from transit. It helped us out as a city to, to maintain and take care of some of the additional costs that COVID had put on the communities. But if you reach out and you talk to 
people that are in the League of Municipalities, not everybody uh, was able to use those fundings um, because, of, because of the way that it was structured. Um, many municipalities are struggling when I, when I sit on these meetings with the League, and I'm sure that Curtis can, can elaborate on that. Sheboygan has been very lucky that we've had the net new construction for the last couple of years. Our, um, from 2019 into, carried into 2020, we had a 13% net new construction, but the majority of the communities within the state of Wisconsin have not had that luxury. And with COVID, we're really going to see uh, somewhat of a slowdown. I don't wanna say a stop, but definitely a slowdown. Part of the problem that we have as a community is that the fact that that 13% was TID related. So TIDs are great and, I, and I'm very happy that we have them, but we also have to understand that a TID is basically uh, paying forward for development in the, in the future, but basically those costs that we continue to um, uh, have, you know, year over year, whether it's increases in construction, increases in services, inc increases in, in uh, in um, wages and benefits. Those are things that most communities don't have the ability to have the increase that's needed to sustain it. So again, going back to the me meetings that I've been in, more and more communities are struggling more and more. So what's gonna happen is if, if, if we don't start addressing our levy limits, we are going to continue to see reductions in uh, in service, which is what we're responsible for. And I personally think that during a COVID situation like we're in, which is gonna carry into 2022, respectfully, we can't continue to lose services when our, when our constituents need it the most. So um, in closing, I really would like to see our representatives really look into it because many small and rural uh, communities are ex experience experiencing zero to or little net new construction. And Sheboygan County has been very, very fortunate. But again, we, we struck, we're gonna be struggling. In 2022, I'm already anticipating that we're gonna either be flat or we will have to actually cut services. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, legislators, any response or suggestions or questions? Well, I was kind of surprised when I when I saw my tax bill a couple of days ago. Uh, my tax bill went up 6.1 percent, and um, that was a combination of a reduction in the first dollar credit, a reduction in the lottery and gaming credit, and uh, a result of a school referendum in the uh, school district of which I reside. Uh, but a six percent increase in in my net tax is, is uh, pretty substantial, and I, I, I got to believe that that increase is more than what a lot of wage increases are that, that taxpayers are receiving. So uh, I'm trying to balance that with, with uh, your comments on relief of tax levies. So that's what I'm looking at. Terry, one, one thing I would like to point out in, ba in putting our budget together for 2021 and balancing between the equalized and levy limits that we have, technically the city of Sheboygan should have had an increase of around 26 cents uh, per thousand because of our, our levy. Um, but because of the fact that, again, because of COVID, we kept it at the 15 cents. Again, because we've had net new construction but with the equalized balance to levy, um, we were limited to what we could really do. And to go to, this, to constituents and say we want 26 cents, um, that would have been catastrophic in my opinion uh, to ask for that. But th that means that we left levy on the table, which is again growth um, for the city. So again, it's, we're trying to balance what we can and we've had some tremendous growth, but again, again our costs continue to go up and we're, we're, be, we're I, I'm speaking for Sheboygan and I'm speaking for the group that on the League of Municipalities. And again, I ask that Curtis can always jump in and, and, and defend the, the statement that I'm gonna make. But for a, for a levy limit that dates back to 2011, I'm sure that the first couple of years there was still enough fluctuation in the budgets to be able to 
to control it, but I don't believe that there's enough, you know, as the old sta statement, you know, you can cut fat. At some point, you're cutting muscle, and I think that there's a lot of uh, municipalities that are now cutting into the bone. So thank you. Kurt, did you want to add anything to that? You have to unmute. Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this meeting, Mayor. And let me just say congratulations to Senator Lemmyhu. Very, very uh, proud and happy for you and your accomplishment. And uh, Representative Cosma, I'm glad to hear you're likely to be reappointed to finance, uh, <coughs> finance committee. So yeah, Mike, and, and I just want to uh, underscore some of what Todd was saying that um, I think one thing to keep in mind as legislators kind of struggle with this uh, levy limit topic, it has been in place actually since 2006. And then in 2011, it, it turned into this very restrictive one where you can only increase your levy, a municipality can only increase its levy from one year to the next by the amount of new construction as it's experiencing. And there's a lot of communities that aren't as lucky as Sheboygan. Many, many, many communities aren't as lucky as Sheboygan to have um, growth. And so they've been stagnant as far as for many years in, in their ability to increase their levy from one year to the next. While all you know, typical inflationary growth and expenses continue uh, from year in and year out, and, and these communities aren't able to keep up or match that. So you know, two things in our legislative agenda that I think could address that. One would be to restore what was in place in the first five or so years of levy limits where there was basically inflationary increase allowed, at least, at least a minimum. If your community was not experiencing any growth, new construction, uh, you'd be able to increase your levy by the amount of uh, inflation that the, that the state is experiencing. Um, the other change would be some, um, r remove a enhancement of levy limits uh, that was created about 2011 or 2013 or so that makes it, um, impossible really for a community to turn to fees to pay for certain services without having an imp impact on their levy and reducing their, their levy even more. So for example, I know Sheboygan already has a stormwater utility. Many communities do not have a stormwater utility, so they're still trying to pay for the mandate that they treat stormwater before it goes into our rivers and our lakes, but off of the levy. So um, it would be helpful for those communities to uh, meet that mandate by creating a stormwater utility. But if you do so, uh, any community that doesn't have a stormwater utility currently, if they create one, they would have to reduce their allowable levy. Getting rid of that uh, further restriction would be very helpful too. So those are two ideas. We'll be, we'll be by to talk more about these as, as, uh, as the Joint Finance Committee, you know, works through the budget process. and. And Representative Kotsima voted for something very, very helpful to municipalities along those lines uh, last, last the budget. I appreciate that. And, and we'll continue to have those discussions. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with you this morning about that. Kurt, and one other thing we should add is uh, you're right, Sheboygan does have a stormwater utility, but about a decade ago, council uh, put the rate at zero. So it really is, uh, has been ineffective for the last decade for us. And if we would institute it now, we'd have to reduce our uh, something else in order to compensate for it because of the way levy limits are structured. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, proposed changes in the utility aid program. Um, back in late 2019, uh, Sheboygan was informed that uh, because Lion Energy had closed Unit 3 and 4, that we were going to lose uh, uh, about half of our utility aid payments of $1.2 million. Earlier that year, the state had given us information that we would be receiving all of that money, and that the late adjustment was, uh, was very tough for us, and uh, we, we basically had to just go into our general fund and, and, and uh, move money over because we didn't have any other way to deal with uh, that much uh, revenue loss. And uh, I approached uh, both uh, uh, Senator Lemahieu and Representative Katzma, is there anything we can do? Because normally when a facility closes, a plant closes, you get a five-year phase out of those funds. 
And because this was two units within a, a plant that was still gonna stay open, it was just a drop in the bucket and boom, it's, it's there and you have to absorb it all right away. And I know the gentlemen have done some, uh, some looking into that. So I'm just wondering, when we talked about it, we were very late in the legislative session and we weren't able to any see, see any new legislation to modify those laws uh, introduced. But uh, is there something we can still do where Sheboygan could qualify for part of those uh, phase-out dollars? So I'll turn it over to Senator Lemahieu or Representative Kotsma. You'd like to go first, Terry? Or? Sure, I'll go first. Um, okay. The... We've had a briefing from the utilities on, on some of their plans as far as phase outs of, of uh, plants, similar to what happened in Edgewater. Uh, so we feel that this is going to be something that needs to address, needs to be addressed on a statewide issue. Uh, so, um, but to my knowledge, there is nothing specific that has been proposed at this, uh, up to this point. I mean, so, yeah, we've been looking into this for a while, obviously, with you, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. And uh, sort of the, the most frustrating thing that we found in the process, outside of trying to get information from um, the different agencies and, how the, and why they were doing it this way, is there's even some decommissioned plants that are still getting their full utility aid payments that are totally decommissioned, and they're waiting until... <clears throat> either that property is, is sold or restored to start that step down process. So just the way they're administering the program um, from, from plant to plant around the state, it has been very frustrating. Um, so yes, we've been working with um, different agencies in government, uh, ledge council, uh, the reference bureau, things like that, trying to figure out why um, the agencies are are interpreting the law the way they are, um, which seems like they're using the most prescriptive um, interpretation of the law in your case and in other <coughs> cases where a plant is totally being decommissioned, um, which by the way, Edgewater is working towards total decommissioning. So it's, it's sort of frustrating that they're treating it this way. Um, whereas other plants, <coughs> which just went from you know, 100% production down to nothing um, is being treated differently. I think that one of the things that triggers this change is when the utility submits a report to the state. Now, in the case of Alliant Energy, Unit 3 was closed down about two years prior to this notice being given. But when they closed down Unit 4, I don't know if they just noticed it or whatever, but we got utility aid payments for unit three for two years longer than we, we, we maybe should have. And so a lot of it may depend on what that utility does and their reporting to the state on this. But I guess uh, my, my question is, do you see some path for uh, some legislation that will at least address this issue uh, for the city of Sheboygan? We're not going to pass it just for one case. Um, we need to still work with the different agencies to try to figure out why they're, and see if they can find a good interpretation of how this, this can be done. Um, so they're treating everybody fairly. But I mean, it would be, the fix wouldn't be just for your instance, it would be statewide um, for all utilities. Well, I think, you know, something that uh, would propose that any facility that shuts down a unit and they still have a plant that's operating, that that unit, because uh, much of the utility aid payments are calculated on the amount of kilowatts that are produced. So if those kilowatts are adjusted, then they should still qualify for that phase out. And that would affect everybody in the state. And with many of the utilities looking at changing to solar and wind, uh, you know, this is gonna happen more. So I think it's very important that you consider that. The one thing we are asking that would affect us is maybe, as well as I think Green Bay, uh, that 
that the, the utilities where they've done this already, they'd at least qualify for the, uh, the trailing uh, phase out rates. So we may have missed uh, the first or two years, but we still qualify for the final three years of that normal phase out. You think that's a possibility? We'll take a look at it, but I certainly I, I can't commit what's going to happen. I understand. Well, thank you for that commitment to look at it, and we'll talk to you more about that later then. Next, I'd like to move on to private, uh, public and private property damage due to Lake Michigan water levels. Um, and, and just talk a little bit about, uh, does the state have any programs that a local municipality like Sheboygan could apply to? We have a sewer line on the south side of Sheboygan that's right along the bank of the lake, and uh, we, we have to reinforce that and so that those uh, lines still work. On the north side, by our water treatment plant, we're planning a, a raw water intake project, and the, the land where we want to build the, uh, re, the new well for this project is beginning to be attacked by the lake again, and we have to do more work to reinforce it. And then we've got some other small projects you know, along some of our trails and things along the lake. Is there any uh, help that uh, you feel the state can provide for some of these infrastructure improvements that are needed to maintain our borders with uh, Lake Michigan? Trying to find my new button. Um, so, once again, we've been talking about this for a while, and if there's not a state of emergency, most most funds aren't available, such as FEMA and things like that. Um, you know, if, if you have a proposal, um, if there's a quantified amount, you know, we can talk to the governor and, and his office and, and see what's available. But just generally saying the water's rising and it's doing some damage here and there. I mean, that's not quantifiable. Okay, well, we'll work on getting that together for you. Um, is, is, is there anything that, that our federal partners uh, are looking at? Certainly the Lake Michigan is, is high, not just in Sheboygan County, uh, but you know, what can government do to, to <clears throat> adjust the lake level? Well, nothing, but what, what can we do? Is, is there any anything that's being done on the federal level? Well, one of the things we are doing is uh, FEMA has a new BRIC program, Building Infrastructure and Resiliency. And uh, that program uh, has to be submitted to the, our projects have to be submitted to the state, which we've done and met the applications. Uh, we're working with the state right now and seeing our projects submitted to the federal government. Now this is a competitive program and they only have uh, $500 million to distribute around the United States. So we're at least uh, trying to see if we can get some uh, help through that FEMA program that's available to us. Um, and uh, time will tell whether or not we're successful with that. If we aren't, then, then we have to look to, to other avenues to cover some of those costs. And by the way, you know, the work uh, that- Mr. Uh, Mayor. Yes. I was just going to say, if, um, if you want to let us know when your application, you're going to submit your application, we'd be happy to do a letter of support for you on that grant application. All right. Thank you very much, Alan. Appreciate that. I just have a, a real quick statement. Um, it, state of, it, sound, it sounds like the state of Michigan actually declared um, a state of emergency because of the high levels. I'm just wondering why the state of Wisconsin hasn't had the, the, same, the same effect. Um, it is affecting everybody. I know it, obviously in Sheboygan County we've had a lot of erosion, a lot of constituents uh, losing a lot of property, not to, not to mention just the, the effect on our um, on the location of our um, our piping that that the mayor had mentioned, which is right along the the, the lake shore, also. Thank you. That would be a great question for the governor's office, since the governor issues state 
of emergency. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is TIDS uh, sharing with other TIDS. Um, there's been some legislation recently to allow more of this. So if you do have a successful TID, rather than having to close one out uh, that isn't uh, producing and, and absorb that, uh, it, it, we're, we're looking to see if uh, the state legislature could adjust the laws to allow some of those successful TIDs to have more opportunities to share with uh, the ones that maybe aren't doing so well. Uh, Chad, did you want to add anything on that? Is Brian from the SCEDC on the phone? No, I don't see him. Well, I understand, this is Chad Peleshek, the Director of City Development. I understand that there was an assembly, 2019 Assembly Bill 859, um, that was supposed to be going to the Senate and didn't, I don't think it made it, but there was two pieces of multi-use TIF residential increase um, for the percentage of land that can be in a TIF district as it relates to resident. Uh, residential and then there was a TIF housing extension so under current law there's a one-year extension that can be granted for TIDs and there was a request to increase that to three years for affordable and workforce housing so I'm just wondering um, if anybody can shed any light on that bill and whether it's going to come back or where it is. Chad was this bill passed in the assembly did you say? I believe it was. There's a lot of bills that we passed, uh, um, and I'm assuming in the Senate was unable to uh, to take a look at some of those. I'm, I'm assuming if they were a good bill and they passed our house, we would be looking at it again. Yeah, Terry, that uh, AB 859 one, that's uh, a Rob Brooks bill that looks like it was passed on one of our last session days in in February. So it's probably one of those, I, I, not speaking for the Senate, but one of those that uh, may just have gotten caught up in COVID. Well, Representative Orpagel, thanks for joining us. And congratulations on uh, your election to head the majority caucus. Thanks, sorry it was a few minutes late, but uh, Again, always is always looking forward to working with all of you. Kurt, did you have any input on that particular issue? Yes, Mayor, um, and, and Representative Vorpagel is exactly right. Uh, we were supportive, the realtors were supportive, the builders were supportive of a package that came out of Rep Representative Brooks's office that the assembly did pass right at the end. And one of the things it did was extend this ability to use um, uh, TIF dollars for affordable housing, workforce housing from one year, which is current law after TIF closes to three years. Uh, but it had a number of other provisions in it too that we liked a lot. Um, and, and this leads me to a question that I just wanted to ask uh, Senator Lemieux. Um, if your caucus has had any discussion about kind of prioritizing some of that, those bills, those 90 or 100 bills that the assembly passed right at the end, that were may have had a lot of support within your caucus, but because of COVID, uh, you weren't able to meet that last floor date. I was just wondering if there's been any discussion about maybe prioritizing those early in, early in the session. I know they ought to be reintroduced, and we'll be working on that. But has there been any discussion about that within your caucus? Yeah, Kurt. Thanks for the question. So we've been uh, we've been working through those bills, sort of in my office, just in case. This um, conference will now be recorded. <laughs> just just in case we did come back um, into session here in, in December, some of those bills that we could possibly take up that didn't have any um, dollars attached to them at this point. Um, so we, we started the process of going through that list. I think hopefully uh, there are a lot of good bills in there. I had a couple myself that, that didn't get through the Senate that I'd like to see done uh, next session. So, um, so yeah, I think hopefully um, moving into next session, there are, like, like you mentioned, there are I don't know if there were 90 that had no no funding attached to them, but there were a good amount of bills that had bipartisan support that we were still planning to take up in the Senate prior to COVID hitting, and hopefully we can get those done early early this upcoming session. Great, thank you. 
Okay. Uh, Time to. Ed, may I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. In preparation for this meeting, I, I watched the presentation that Development Director Chad did to the City Council in June or July with a nice overview of the 11 TIDs that the City of Sheboygan has. And um, uh, I was pleasantly surprised at the, or um, I was happy to see the um, positive balances in, in many of those projects. Um, and the, uh, I think the, you're well under the 12% limit at 190 million uh, compared to or your total valuation was 350 million. Um, and, um, but I, I was looking at all, you know, the, the areas of the, of the TIDs and do you know, like a rough number of the square miles or, or how much, what percentage of the city is currently covered in a TID district? Just round numbers. That's a really good question. I don't know that I can answer that. I would have to do a little bit more uh, searching, but just high level, I would say about a third. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for your discussion on these issues on the agenda. Now we'll go into a round table and I'm just gonna call off uh, uh, members who are here and see if they have anything they'd like to add. Alderperson Barb Feldy. Okay. Um, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, Barb. Next, Charles Adams. Nothing, thank you. Thank you. Chris Domagolski. No, nothing today, thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Beeble. Uh, nothing from my end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fire Chief uh, Eric Montanello. Uh, nothing. Happy holidays, everybody, but no, nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Derek Mink, Director of Transit. I have nothing today, Mayor, but I do want to say thank you to the legislators for joining us and happy holidays. Thank you very much. Anyone else here in the, in the council chambers? Okay, other person, rather administrator, uh, administrator I'm not, Wolf. I'm not the only one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I just want to say happy holidays to everyone and congratulations. Um, but I do ask that you guys, that you all continue to uh, obviously focus on the COVID as that's uh, our present task at hand, but that we also continue to work towards how we can uh, continuously uh, grow our communities and provide the services that our constituents want. Um, and you know, please, please consider some some levy adjustments uh, to help us all in uh, in these uh, unprecedented times. Again, happy holidays. Thank you. And I'd just like to close with uh, thank everyone for their time today. It's a, a great uh, opportunity to, to talk to you uh, in this type of a meeting. I think we've adapted it pretty well for COVID and a virtual situation. But again, congratulations on your elections to leadership positions. And I appreciate the work that you did to achieve that. And uh, have a great holiday. Any other responses? Okay. Uh, then, uh, if it's okay with everyone, we'll adjourn for today and thank you for your time. Have a great day. Uh -huh.